On October 22, 1962, President John F. Kennedy broadcast a special message to the nation from his office in the White House. Here is President Kennedy as he delivered that message bearing on recent events in Cuba. In October of 1962, a 13-day crisis emerged between the U.S., the Soviet Union, and Cuba. During the time, Americans felt great fear that nuclear war was upon them. John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, bore the responsibility of ensuring and protecting American safety. The events during the Cuban Missile Crisis convinced world leaders such as President Kennedy, Nikita Khrushchev, and Fidel Castro to take the responsibility to avoid nuclear war for the better of their citizens and the world. In 1953, the Cuban Revolution began. Fidel Castro, the leader of the revolution, fought to overthrow Cuban President Fulgencio Bautista in order to establish his Communist Party. The Cuban Revolution was the start of the relationship between Cuba and the Soviets. On April 17, 1961, CIA trained Cuban exiles with expectations that the majority of the Cuban population would join in on the fight, tried to invade Cuba to overthrow Castro. The plan failed when the Cuban population did not join in, which forced Kennedy to pull the air support at the last second. This event has become to be known as the failed invasion of the Bay of Pigs. America and the USSR were in the midst of the Cold War and both were equally involved in the intense race of nuclear warfare development. One day after the Bay of Pigs invasion, Kennedy met with Khrushchev in Vienna. Their relationship worsened when Kennedy proclaimed that he supported the non-communist West Berlin. Khrushchev was also concerned with the American missiles that were placed in Turkey. Along with America's numerous foreign affairs, the U.S. suffered from social unrest caused by the Civil Rights Movement. The most severe conflicts occurred in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, well, my name is Chuck Combs. Um, I was born in 1940. After college, I was admitted to Officer Kennedy Naval Officer Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, I went into OCS in um, September of 62, 1962, and I was commissioned in December of 62 as an ensign, and I spent my time aboard a destroyer, the USS Black. The crisis began on October 16, 1962 when a U-2 spy plane flew over Cuba and discovered undisputable evidence of Soviet missile sites on the island. The missiles posed a great threat to America because they had the range to hit from anywhere from Miami to Seattle. Well, it was in Newport, Rhode Island, and again, I was uh, finishing up my officer candidate training and uh, we would look out every morning and we'd see uh, several dozen uh, Navy destroyers, uh, cruisers, battleships. And so it was a whole bay full of Army, or I mean, of Navy battleships, warships. And uh, we woke up uh, one morning and looked out and there were no ships there, zero, blank. And of course, that's quite a shock. And, uh, we did not know what was going on. Our uh, commanding officers, they did not let us know until later on that day. Nobody was allowed to leave the base. Um, and then what we found out later on that day, that really the only thing that we knew was that it had something to do with Russia, it had something to do with Cuba, and it had something to do with missiles. And it wasn't until the next day that we found out the, the details of, of the blockade. On the third day, October 18th, Kennedy is visited by Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko. Gromyko, unaware that Kennedy knows about the missiles, claims that the Soviet influence in Cuba is only for defensive purposes. And on the fifth day, Kennedy prepares the naval units. 
On the seventh day, October 22nd, Kennedy institutes the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. He instructs them to meet every day throughout the crisis. On this day, Kennedy also addresses the nation of the situation. During his address, he urges for a Navy quarantine. The address immediately sparked panic in the lives of millions of Americans. People feared that nuclear war could happen at any moment. People became so cautious of the possible bombings that grade schools had enforced bomb shelter safety drills. It was a very tense time. Uh, we were not allowed to leave the base, and everything was pretty hush-hush. Uh, but we still could continue to go to classes, and uh, that, that's about all I remember. Throughout the crisis, Kennedy and Khrushchev exchanged letters. After Kennedy's televised address, Khrushchev sends a letter about how he took the quarantine of Cuba as a severe threat. The tensions only heightened from here. On October 25th, the UN suggests that both sides back off. Kennedy refuses until the missiles are finally moved. On October 26th, Khrushchev finally negotiates with Kennedy, offering that he will remove the missiles from Cuba if Kennedy ends the quarantine and promises to not invade Cuba. The next day, a U-2 plane is shot down over Cuba by a Soviet SAM turret. Kennedy then meets with XCOM and is pressured to immediately deploy the military after the death of the American pilot. He does not comply though, so he decides that a negotiation with Khrushchev would be the best option. On the last day of the crisis, final negotiations were made on October 28, 1962. Khrushchev and Kennedy agreed that the missiles would be removed if Kennedy pledges to not invade Cuba. This negotiation finally ends the Cuban Missile Crisis. First of all, immediately following the Cuban Missile Crisis, U.S. and Soviet Union avoided a MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction, scenario. Another short-term impact of the crisis was Kennedy's increase in stature as a powerful leader. His ability to escape nuclear war gained himself support and heightened his role as a leader in both the country and the world. A test ban treaty was signed in October of 1963 by the US, Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom. This is a long-term effect of the Cuban Missile Crisis because it is still in place today. The treaty banned all testing of nuclear weapons except for underground and was created to both slow the arms race happening between world powers and to refrain from nuclear war scares happening again. Secondly, a U.S.-Soviet hotline was established in 1963 directly connecting the Pentagon to the Kremlin in Moscow. This Moscow-Washington hotline allowed quick, direct communication between the two world powers to resolve any misunderstandings. Another long-term effect is the Cuban embargo put in place in 1960 that is still in place today. The embargo was established before the crisis, but was made more strict in 1962. Kennedy used this embargo to show Cuba that the U.S. did not want to help them if Cuba was going to support and help the Soviet Union in threats against America. The responsibilities taken by Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro during the Cuban Missile Crisis had lasting impacts in the world, effects that are still felt today. Their initiative and cooperation was able to secure peace in the world. These world leaders were responsible for keeping their people safe, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they did just that. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere, and we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. Thank you and good night.